The woman known to history as Catherine de' Medici was born on the 13th of April 1519 in the city of Florence in Renaissance Italy. Her mother was Madeleine de la Tour d'Auvergne, Countess of Boulogne, who came from an aristocratic background and was descended from an ancient and influential French family with links to the French ruling elite. Her father was Lorenzo de Medici, ruler of Florence from 1516 to 1519 and Duke of Urbino. Unlike his wife, Lorenzo did not come from an aristocratic family, but the Medici family had risen to prominence in the 1430s after making a fortune in banking and acquiring power by financing several European royal families. The Medicis promoted the cultural renaissance in Florence and went on to rule the city for over 300 years, from 1434 to 1737. Many Medicis, including Catherine, made impressive marriages and several Medicis were elected as Pope. Catherine's parents had been married for a year before her birth their union had been planned as part of an alliance between King Francis I of France and Lorenzo's uncle, Pope Leo X, against their mutual rival Holy Roman Emperor, Maximilian I. As a result of her father's heritage, Catherine was perceived as a noblewoman, but not as a member of the upper echelons of the Italian aristocracy. However, her family did wield huge power, wealth, and influence, which would be important in securing Catherine an advantageous match when she reached marrying age. Catherine was an only child and was orphaned not long after her birth. Her mother died of either puerperal fever, caused by an infection picked up during childbirth, or the plague only a few days after Catherine's birth on the 28th of April, 1519. Her father died 21 days after his daughter's birth, possibly from syphilis, on the 4th of May, 1519, at the Villa Medici at Careggi in Florence. He was buried in the Medici Chapel of Florence's Church of San Lorenzo, which was adorned, in true Medici style, with Michelangelo's sculpture, Pensaroso, which represented the Duke. Lorenzo's tomb has often been confused with that of his illustrious grandfather, Lorenzo the Magnificent, which also had a Michelangelo sculpture. Catherine spent her childhood passing between various prominent relations, including her paternal grandmother Alfonsina Orsini and, after she died in 1520, her aunt Clarice de Medici where she was raised along with her cousins. She was raised as a Roman Catholic and received an education befitting a noblewoman from nuns in Florence and Rome. In line with the expectation that Catherine would make an advantageous marriage, possibly to a foreign prince, she would have been taught to speak fluently in Italian, French and Latin at the very least. Grand plans for Catherine's upbringing had been made by more than just her grandmother and aunt. King Francis I of France had wanted Catherine to be raised at the French court, no doubt in order to see her married to a French aristocrat or even one of his own sons. But Pope Leo X blocked this scheme as he planned to have her marry Ippolito de Medici, Lord of Florence. Pope Leo made Catherine Duchess of Urbino in line with this plan, but then annexed most of the Duchy of Urbino in the name of the Papal States, reducing her status. After the death of Pope Leo X in 1521, Medici power in the Vatican was interrupted until Cardinal Giulio de Medici was elected as Pope Clement VII in 1523. It was during this period, between the Medici popes, that Catherine's status as Duchess of Urbino became contentious. The title and lands of the Duke of Urbino were given to Francesca Maria I della Roveri by Pope Leo's successor, Adrian VI. The Florentine people continued to refer to Catherine as Duchessina, meaning the Little Duchess. 
referencing her claim to the Duchy of Urbino. During this time, Catherine stayed in the Palazzo Medici Riccardi, the first Medici palace, the occasional workplace of great artists like Donatello, Michelangelo and Botticelli, and the modern-day seat of local government in Florence. In 1527, the Medicis were overthrown in Florence by a faction which opposed Pope Clement's representative, Cardinal Silvio Passarini. Catherine was taken hostage and moved from convent to convent. Finally, she found consistency and peace at Santissima Annunziata delle Murate for three years, a period which she described as the happiest of her entire life. This momentary interlude in a life defined by political maneuverings must have seemed tranquil. However, the city of Florence was not permanently lost to the Medicis. With an eye on Europe-wide political events, and in order to gain support for the recapture of Florence, Pope Clement crowned the Holy Roman Emperor and King of Spain Charles V in an elaborate and sacred ceremony in the San Petronio Basilica in Bologna on the 24th of February 1530. The coronation aimed to heal the political and religious divides which had blown up when the mutinous Spanish, German and Italian troops of Charles V had sacked Rome in 1527. The alliance would also be used against the threat posed by the Ottoman Turks, who were seeking dominance in Eastern Europe and had reached Vienna, an important royal city in the Holy Roman Empire, in 1529. Charles V's military support in Florence was well rewarded as Charles V was the last Holy Roman Emperor to be awarded the honor of being crowned by a Pope. The retaking of Florence began in October 1529 and lasted until the city surrendered on the 12th of August 1530. During the siege, there were calls for Catherine's execution and even for her naked exposure and use by the troops for sexual gratification. But this period of siege and her residence in Santissima Annunziata delle Murate ended for Catherine when Pope Clement called her to Rome in 1530 in order to find her a husband. While in Rome at the bequest of Pope Clement, Catherine had many suitors. The most illustrious of her suitors was King James V of Scotland, who sent the Duke of Albany to arrange the marriage on two separate occasions, once in April 1530 and again seven months later in November. Although Catherine did not marry the eager Scottish king, their stories would later become entwined when Catherine helped to raise his daughter, Mary Queen of Scots. A second influential suitor was Henry, Duke of Orléans, second son of King Francis I of France and the future King Henry II. Henry belonged to the Valois dynasty, which had ruled France since the 14th century. By early 1533, Henry, was openly courting her, and he was to be a fortuitous match for the wealthy but common-born Catherine. Catherine de Medici and Henry, Duke of Orléans, were married at Église saint ferréol les augustins in Marseille on the 28th of October, 1533, when Catherine was 14. The wedding was an extravagant affair with a grand display of gift-giving and festivities which went on late into the night. The couple and their distinguished guests celebrated with dancing and feasting, and Henry jousted, his favorite pastime, for his new wife's hand. After leaving the ball, the couple consummated their marriage apparently under the watch of King Francis I, who was determined to see the union properly joined. That morning, the couple were visited and blessed in their marital bed by Pope Clement. In the first year of marriage, Catherine saw little of her husband, who openly took mistresses. It was said that Henry was gloomy and introverted because he had spent four years as a captive in Spain during the formative years of his youth, but Catherine's intelligence, wit, and keenness to please made favorable impressions on the ladies of the French court. However, this favorable start to her life in France was quickly reversed. The death of her uncle, Pope Clement, 
on the 25th of September 1534, undermined Catherine's position and influence at court. The situation worsened when Pope Clement's successor, Alessandro Farnese, broke off the alliance with France and ceased to pay Catherine's large dowry. King Francis I apparently lamented Catherine's reversal of fortune and the marriage which had once seemed so fortunate by announcing, the girl has come to me stark naked. As well as her tenuous position as a now dowry-less foreigner, Catherine was also under huge pressure to provide the Valois dynasty with the heir and spare which would ensure the dynasty's survival. The stakes were even higher in France as under Salic law and ancient Frankish civil law code, only males could ascend the throne. Catherine greatly desired a son, a blessing which would cement her position in France, but in the first ten years of their marriage, the couple had no children at all. The pressure to conceive built when Henry's older brother, the Dauphin of France, Francis, died of a fever in 1536. Rumors began to spread that either Catherine or the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V had poisoned the Dauphin. Catherine became the sole target of blame for the lack of a legitimate heir when Henry publicly acknowledged his affair with Philippa Ducie and the birth of his daughter Diane in 1537. It was at this time that divorce was discussed and many clamored for Catherine to be sent back to Italy. In a period when witch hunting was reaching its peak, rumors that Catherine practiced witchcraft began to circulate, feeding into the image of her as the Black Queen which has persisted to today. As a woman's role was viewed in terms of her ability to create and sustain life, infertile women were seen as unnatural and as witches with the opposite power, that of destroying health, life and fertility. Catherine's connection with the astrologer and seer Nostradamus and even more suspicious Ruggeri brothers, who it was believed engaged in necromancy and the black arts, did little to help Catherine's reputation. After trying every natural and superstitious remedy for inducing pregnancy, including drinking mule's urine, Catherine finally gave birth to her first child and son, Francis, on the 19th of January 1544. She went on to have a daughter, Elizabeth, on the 2nd of April 1545, and a further eight children, seven of whom survived infancy. She succeeded in providing the dynasty with five boys who could inherit the throne, the future Francis II, Louis, the future Charles IX, the future Henry III, and Francis, Duke of Anjou. The future of the Valois dynasty was now secure, but Catherine's pregnancies did nothing to improve her marriage. Her husband was devoted to his favorite mistress, Diane de Poitiers, who was 19 years his senior. Catherine's influence was rooted solely in her motherhood as her husband ignored her and she would later become very skilled at presenting herself as the devoted mother of future kings and of France itself. The death of King Francis I on the 31st of March 1547 made Catherine Queen Consort of France. She was crowned in the Basilica of Saint-Denis the resting place of many French kings and a former medieval abbey church in northern Paris on the 10th of June 1549. But she was to enjoy no political influence as queen consort, besides wielding the nominal power of regent during her husband's travels abroad. The days of Catherine's power and influence were all still ahead of her. Instead of utilizing the wisdom and skill of his wife, Henry promoted the influence of his mistress, Diane de Poitiers, giving her the Chateau of Chenonceau. It was even reported by the imperial ambassador that Henry would sit on Diane's lap, discuss politics with her, and stroke her breasts when in company. Diane did not see Catherine as a threat, having already essentially usurped her position and privileges as the wife of the king. Diane actually encouraged Henry to spend time with Catherine and to sire more legitimate children with her. 
In 1556, Catherine almost died in childbirth. The royal surgeons only saved her life in a terrible exchange for the life of one of her twin girls, Joan, who died in the womb, while Victoria survived, but only for seven more weeks. As the king's physician advised Henry against having any more children with Catherine, he stopped visiting her and instead spent all of his time with his long-term mistress, Diane. Catherine would have no more children. Along with her own children, Catherine played a role in raising Mary, Queen of Scots, daughter of her once suitor, James V of Scotland. Mary's mother, Mary of Guise, was the sister of Henry's boyhood friend, Francis, Duke of Guise, and had married King James V of Scotland in 1538. Mary of Guise ruled Scotland as regent for her daughter Mary, who had taken the throne when she was less than one week old. Mary, Queen of Scots, lived at the French court from the age of five and was promised in marriage to Catherine's eldest son, the Dauphin Francis. Francis and Mary were married on the 24th of April, 1558, when Francis was 15 years old and Mary was 17 years old. They would be married for only two years due to the premature death of Francis. In 1559, Catherine's eldest daughter, Elizabeth, became the second among her children to marry. The marriage, like Catherine's own, was part of a political alliance. After the death of Catherine's father, Lorenzo de' Medici, in 1492, the balance of power and economic growth of Catherine's home country Italy collapsed. This combination of wealth and political instability drew in Italy's enemies, and for over 50 years, from 1494 to 1559, the Italian peninsula became a battleground between the French Valois dynasty, the Habsburgs, the Ottoman Turks, and the English. These long Italian wars, sometimes called the Habsburg-Valois Wars, were brought to an end on the 3rd to the 4th of April, 1559, when Henry II signed the Peace of Cato Cambresis with Philip II of Spain and Elizabeth I of England. The treaty was sealed with the marriage of the 13-year-old Elizabeth to King Philip II of Spain, a fellow Catholic. The union was celebrated in Paris on the 22nd of June, 1559, with five days of jousting, festivities, balls and masks, a form of courtly entertainment from Italy in which participants dance and exchange gifts with their host while in disguise. Despite the lavishness of the entertainments, the marriage was only a proxy wedding, as the couple themselves were not present. Henry took part in the celebratory jousting, boldly wearing his mistress Diane's black and white colors, he was victorious against his friend the Duke of Guise and the Duke of Namur, but was knocked off his saddle by Gabriel de Lorge, the Earl of Montgomery, in an honorable joust. Insisting on riding out again against Montgomery, Henry's face was shattered by Montgomery's lance. Reeling from the clash, with blood pouring down his face and large splinters buried deep in his eye and head, Henry was carried away. Catherine, Diane, and Francis the Dauphin are said to have all fainted at the terrible sight. After the splinters were removed from his eye and brain at the Chateau de Tonnelle, the king lay in a shifting state. Catherine stayed with him, but Diane stayed away for fear of being expelled by the queen. Over the next ten days, Henry sat up to dictate letters and listened to music, but began to lose his sight, speech, and reason, finally dying on the 10th of July, 1559, at the age of 40. From this day, Catherine adopted the broken lance as her emblem, inscribed with the words, Lacrimae hinc hinc dolor, meaning, from this come my tears, my pain, and wore mourning black for the rest of her life, in memory of her husband. Catherine recognized that image cultivation was an important part of successful kingship and worked to promote an image of herself 
as a faithful widow and devoted mother. In 1559, at 40 years old, Catherine took her first steps into the political spotlight after her husband's death. She insisted on being called Queen Mother rather than Dowager, which solidified the image of herself she wanted to project, that of a loving and devoted mother, and the title amplified her closeness to the next monarch, her son Francis. Francis II, Catherine's oldest son, became King of France at the age of 15. His coronation was held in Rheims on the 21st of September 1559. It was said that the crown was so heavy that Francis couldn't hold it up alone and required trusted nobles to help hold it in place on his head. It was rumored that Francis was frail and of ill health. He had married Mary, Queen of Scots, the year before, and, in what has been called a coup d'etat, Francis, the Duke of Guise, and his brother, Charles, Cardinal of Lorraine, seized power, moving themselves into the Louvre Palace with the young couple. The House of Guise were staunch supporters of the Roman Catholic cause, but after failing to aid the Catholics in Scotland, the old alliance between Catholic France and Scotland was dissolved, causing the Guises to focus their Catholic campaign on France. Out of necessity, Catherine worked with the Guises because she was not guaranteed a role in Francis's government as he was deemed old enough to rule alone. In France, the royal age of majority was 14. Yet, she was to wield greater power as the mother of the king than she had done as the wife of the king. King Francis II's official acts began with this being the good pleasure of the Queen, my Lady Mother, and I also approving of every opinion that she holdeth, am content and command that. Catherine exploited her newfound authority. She forced Diane de Poitiers to hand over the crown jewels and vacate the Chateau de Chenonceau before proceeding to undo all of Diane's building work there. All those at the court and in government who had been patronized by Diane were quickly replaced, including Jean Bertrand, Keeper of the Seals of France, who was succeeded by Chancellor François Olivier, who had been dismissed by Diane a few years previously. As the Guise brothers and the new French government set to policy-making, the issue of the religious conflict was becoming desperate. Religious divisions had grown across the whole of Europe as the Protestant Reformation ignited by Martin Luther's criticism of the Roman Catholic Church, unleashed a complex political and religious storm which engulfed the whole of Europe and France in particular. The Valois royal family were Catholic, but France had a growing Protestant population and its neighbors, including Great Britain, the Netherlands, Scandinavia and parts of Germany, were turning to Protestantism. The Huguenots were a group of French Protestants who followed the Reformed or Calvinist Protestant faith. They made up almost 10% of the French population and practiced their religion publicly. The Huguenots were vocal in their criticism of the Catholic Church, denouncing the Pope as a tyrant, holding false sway over God's creation. Religious violence was played out on the streets of France. Lynchings and murders had religious motivations, Churches were sacked, sacred texts were destroyed, and the bodies of saints were dug up and burned. Clearly, the government had to do something, but the policies of the Guise brothers did not at all fit with Catherine's preferred course of action. The Guise brothers began persecuting Protestants, but Catherine adopted a more moderate stance and spoke out against the persecutions. Although she had been raised as a Roman Catholic and had been related to several popes, the depth of her religious conviction was questioned as she prioritized peace over religious principles. Whether her conciliatory policy was rooted in her lack of religious conviction, her belief in freedom of worship, desire for peace at any cost, or, more likely, her political acumen, Catherine succeeded in crafting a place for herself in the political sphere in opposition to the Guises. The hardline stance taken up by the Guise brothers fueled the conflict. The Huguenots 
looked to Antoine de Bourbon, King of Navarre, and then to his brother Louis de Bourbon, Prince of Condé, for support to topple the Guises. With the rise of religious violence, the royal court was moved to the fortified Chateau of Ambois in the Loire Valley in central France. The Duke of Guise then launched a surprise attack on the Huguenots in the woods nearby and killed many, including the Huguenots' commander, La Renaudie. As Catherine and her court watched, many of the rebels were slain, drowned in the river, or were strung up around the battlements. Catherine found an ally for her strategies for defending the law in the face of the growing anarchy when Chancellor Michel de l'Hôpital was appointed in June 1560. Neither Catherine nor the new Chancellor agreed with the practice pursued by the Guise brothers of punishing Protestants who were peaceful and worshipped privately. Catherine and Chancellor de l'Hôpital put their policy of conciliation to an assembly of the Privy Council at Fontainebleau on the 20th of August, 1560. Historians have seen this stroke of effective diplomacy as an early example of Catherine's talent for statesmanship as she set her policy for peace in opposition to the Guise brothers. Meanwhile, the Prince of Condé's army began attacking towns in the south of France in the autumn of 1560. Catherine ordered the Prince of Condé to the royal court and when he arrived, had him imprisoned, tried for offences against the crown, and sentenced to death. His life was saved by the timely death of the king, the result of an ear infection or abscess in his brain. Showing her astuteness, Catherine recognized that her son's death was imminent and made a pact with Antoine de Bourbon, a Huguenot leader, to the benefit of her second son, Charles. Antoine de Bourbon agreed to renounce his right to the regency of the future king, Charles IX, in return for the release of his brother. So, when Francis II died on the 5th of December 1560, Catherine was appointed governor of France by the Privy Council. For the first time, she was to have sweeping powers. After her rise into the government, Catherine wrote a letter to her daughter Elizabeth expressing her views about power. My principal aim is to have the honor of God before my eyes in all things and to preserve my authority not for myself, but for the conservation of this kingdom and for the good of all your brothers. The coronation of Charles IX saw Catherine's influence solidified. The nine-year-old Charles IX is said to have cried through his coronation. Catherine kept him close during the start of his reign, reportedly sleeping in his chamber and certainly presiding over his council, policy-making, state business and patronage. Charles was not just vulnerable due to his youth. Like his older brother, he was not a healthy child. The Venetian ambassador reported that Charles was an admirable child, though he is not robust. He favors physical exercises that is too violent for his health, for he suffers from shortness of breath. The frailty of the boy on the throne was compounded by the volatile situation in France at the time. Catherine seized the reins of power for her frail son, but she never controlled the whole country as France was engulfed in a civil war. Large swathes of the country were ruled by noblemen and religious divides impeded political power. Catherine summoned the church leaders from both sides of the religious divide to solve their doctrinal differences. Leaders of the Catholic and Protestant churches in France met, on Catherine's instructions, to find a compromise between their religious convictions. Despite Catherine's optimism, the Colloquy of Poissy as this meeting was called, failed, and on the 13th of October, 1561, the meeting dissolved itself without her permission. Politics had blinded Catherine to reality. She had failed to understand the religious divides which were impeding the functioning of political power. She believed that getting the religious leaders to agree would resolve everything and completely underestimated the strength of religious convictions. 
In an attempt to make a success of her conciliation policy, Catherine issued the Edict of Saint-Germain in January 1562. The edict aimed to promote tolerance between the religious groups and pacify the Protestants. However, the massacre of Vassy on the 1st of March 1562 undid all her efforts. The Duke of Guise and his men attacked worshipping Huguenots in a barn at Vassy, killing 74 and wounding 104. Guise was treated as a hero by the Parisian population. The Huguenots called for revenge. For the next 30 years, France flitted between states of outright civil war and an uneasy truce. Within a month of the infamous massacre of Vassy, Huguenots Louis de Bourbon and Admiral Gaspard de Coligny had raised an army of 1,800 and formed a useful alliance with England. The Duke of Guise's hard-line policy towards the Huguenots fueled Huguenot victories who began seizing town after town. Catherine met with Admiral Coligny to find a compromise, but the talks reached a stalemate and Catherine resorted to meeting violence with violence. The royal army struck swiftly, laying siege to Huguenot-held Rouen. Catherine visited the field herself against the warnings of her advisors and attended the deathbed of Huguenot leader Antoine de Bourbon, King of Navarre, when he was fatally wounded. But the Catholic triumph was short-lived, as on the 18th of February 1563, a spy, Poltro de Meret, killed the Duke of Guise with an arquebus. The first gun fired from the shoulder and resembling a rifle at the Siege of Orléans, triggering a blood feud amongst the aristocratic families on either side of the religious divide. Catherine was delighted at Giza's death as his hand was removed from her son's government. She reportedly told the Venetian ambassador that if Monsieur de Guise had perished sooner, peace would have been achieved more quickly. Finally, the war was brought to an end on the 19th of March 1563 with the signing of the Edict of Amboise, also known as the Edict of Pacification. But France's problems were not over as the English retained a power base on the French coast, so Catherine rallied both Huguenot and Catholic forces to retake Le Havre from the English. These successes did not change the fundamental fact that Catherine's power was not her own. On the 17th of August 1563, it was declared at the Parliament of Rouen that Charles IX had now reached majority age and could rule alone. But Charles continued to show little interest in the technicalities of ruling and Catherine continued to steer him. Intent on reviving loyalty to the crown after a tumultuous period, Catherine took a long tour of France with Charles from January 1564 to May 1565. She aimed to bolster the Edict of Amboise, the hard-won peace, and promote unity, and to this end, she held talks with Jeanne d'Albret, the Protestant Queen Regent of Navarre, wife of the late Antoine de Bourbon, and mother of King Henry III of Navarre. But her attempts at unity were not received with praise from everyone. When visiting her daughter Elizabeth, her son-in-law, the devoutly Catholic Philip of Spain, refused to see her and instead sent the Duke of Alba to tell her to tackle heresy more brutally, advice which Catherine ignored. Catherine's conciliatory policies were failing to bring the religious conflict to an end. On the 27th of September 1567, the Huguenots attempted to ambush the king, an event known as the Surprise of Meaux, and the civil war continued. The French court fled to Paris to escape the encroaching violence. Bloodshed and civil unrest continued well after another peace settlement was agreed, the Peace of Longjumeau on the 22nd to 23rd of March 1568. The Surprise of Meaux marked a turning point in Catherine's policy towards the Huguenots. She finally abandoned her policy of compromise for one of repression once the Huguenots had targeted the king. In June 1568, 
she told the Venetian ambassador that the Huguenots were traitors and praised the Duke of Alba's reign of terror in the Netherlands, where Calvinists and rebels were executed in their thousands. The Royalist army forced the Huguenots to retreat to the fortified stronghold of La Rochelle on the west coast, where Jeanne d'Albret and her 15-year-old son Henry of Navarre joined them. Around this time, Jean wrote to Catherine, expressing her desire to die rather than abandon her god and religion. Catherine, who had always underestimated the religious conviction of the Huguenot, decried Jean as the most shameless woman in the world. Catherine saw Jean's decision to rebel as a deliberate dynastic threat rather than a move fueled by religious conviction. But despite Catherine's anger, Fighting on was no longer an option. On the 8th of August, 1570, the Peace of Saint-Germain-en-Laye was signed because the royal army had run out of money. Despite Catherine's decision to pursue a more hard-line policy, this latest peace actually conceded wider toleration to the Huguenots than ever before. Whether this was the result of the throne's weak negotiating position, or part of Catherine's old and preferred conciliatory policy is unclear. With a temporary peace in place, Catherine sought to bolster Valois' interests and power by setting up several grand dynastic marriages. In 1570, King Charles IX married Elizabeth of Austria, daughter of Maximilian II, Holy Roman Emperor, in a proxy wedding in Speyer in modern-day Germany. Catherine also sought a match between one of her sons and England's Elizabeth I, but this idea never took off. She worked to replenish the family's connection with Philip II of Spain after his wife and her oldest daughter, Elizabeth, died in childbirth in 1568. She planned to marry her youngest daughter, Margaret, to Philip, and also sought a union between Margaret and Henry of Navarre the son of Jean d'Albret, to combine Valois and Bourbon interests. However, Margaret was secretly involved with Henry of Guise, son of the late Duke of Guise, which resulted in a beating from her mother, Catherine, and her brother, the King, when they found out. Catherine succeeded in luring Jean to court and convinced her to agree to a marriage between Margaret and Jean's son, Henry, with the caveat that Henry be permitted to remain a Huguenot. The wedding that took place on the 18th of August, 1572 at Notre Dame, Paris, was overshadowed somewhat by the recent death of Jeanne, who was taken ill upon her arrival in Paris. It was said that Catherine had murdered her with poisoned gloves. The rumor that Catherine had killed Jeanne d'Albret was not the most damaging rumor about her circulating that summer in 1572. Catherine's reputation was to be stained by the events of the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, which began only days after her daughter Margaret's wedding. On the 21st of August, 1572, three days after the royal wedding which had brought influential Huguenots to Paris, Admiral Coligny, the Huguenot leader, was shot while walking home from the Louvre. A smoking arquebus was discovered in a window, but the culprit escaped. Coligny was treated by surgeon Ambroise Paré, who removed the bullet from his elbow and amputated a damaged finger with a pair of scissors. Catherine made a tearful visit to Coligny, despite apparently receiving the news of this attack without any display of emotion, and promised revenge on his attacker. Several historians have blamed Catherine for the attack on Coligny. Others have pointed to the Guise family, or to a Spanish papal plot to end Coligny's influence on the king. Whatever the truth, the bloodbath that followed grew quickly out of control. Two days later, on the 23rd of August, 1572, the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre broke out. Roman Catholic mobs murdered Protestant Huguenots en masse. Innocents were targeted, including children, the elderly, and pregnant women. Bodies were thrown into the River Seine and corpses were hung in the streets. Paintings of the carnage on the streets of Paris show unimaginable horrors and often 
such as the painting by Protestant painter Francois Dubois, the black-clad figure of Catherine looking coldly upon the violence. It was said that Catherine was party to Charles IX's decision to kill them all as he aimed to strike first against an expected Huguenot revenge attack for the shooting of Coligny. The slaughter lasted for a week and spread outwards from Paris across much of France, where it lasted into the autumn, becoming a season of slaughter, as historian Jules Michelet put it. In total, approximately 3,000 Protestants were killed in Paris and a further 70,000 across the whole of France. After the bloodshed finally abated in Paris, Catherine's reputation was in tatters but she was not downcast. Her son-in-law, Henry of Navarre, knelt at an altar as a Roman Catholic on the 29th of September, having converted to avoid death. And, as the ambassadors reported, Catherine had laughed triumphantly at the sight. The legend of the wicked Italian, the Black Queen, spread from this moment. She was accused of being a disciple of Machiavelli, of using the tactics of his treatise, The Prince, to remove all of her enemies in one deadly blow. It was a well-targeted criticism, given that Machiavelli had dedicated The Prince to Catherine's father, Lorenzo. The Huguenots responded to the massacre with propaganda, a tactic made doubly effective by their mastery of the relatively new art of printing with a printing press. Within weeks, Propaganda papers were produced and distributed en masse, and Catherine was their natural target. In 1575, a particularly influential manuscript by an anonymous author titled Discours merveilleux de la vie, action et déportement de Catherine de Medici blamed Catherine for the massacre and denounced her as the epitome of female evil. The manuscript became a bestseller and triggered an avalanche of propaganda and accusations against Catherine. Her reputation as a devoted queen mother was permanently blackened and old prejudices against her as a duplicitous Florentine and power-hungry Medici resurfaced. The black clothes she wore as an ongoing sign of her loyalty to her late husband were turned into the costume of an angel of death. The document had achieved its aim of preventing Catherine from consolidating her power after the death of her second son, Charles IX. Some even called for her to be put on trial for the murder of the Huguenots. The debate over the level of responsibility Catherine held for the horrific events of St. Bartholomew's Day is still ongoing. Some historians have argued that Catherine perhaps ordered the assassination of several Protestant leaders while they were together in Paris for the wedding, but that the scale and unpredictability of the actions of the mob could not have been ordered or controlled by anyone. Yet Catherine had almost always opted for a conciliatory path. She wanted unity and peace for the sake of political stability and the longevity of the Valois dynasty. She had organized the wedding between her own daughter and Henry of Navarre and had invited prominent Huguenot to the celebrations in Paris. It seems unlikely that she would then set out to ruin this opportunity for unity, which she herself had created by calling forth a violent mob to massacre the Huguenot. And she continued to act in line with her policy of conciliation well after the massacre and its aftermath. But the Protestants, and anyone who had become tired of Catherine's moderate policies, remained convinced that she was to blame for the massacre. As with the painting by Protestant painter Francois Dubois and the Discours Merveilleux manuscript, the criticism of Catherine would play out loudly on the public stage and in the realm of the arts, and Catherine would not take it lying down. Catherine believed, as many Renaissance princes and scholars did, that power depended as much on cultural display as on force. She had inherited the Medici family's taste for fine art and became a patroness of the arts, bolstering French culture as much as her family had in Florence. In an age of declining loyalty to the monarchy, 
she used the arts to increase the prestige of the Valois dynasty, launching an artistic patronage program which lasted for three decades. She tapped into the rising popularity of portraiture by inviting resident portrait artists to the French court and commissioning thousands of portraits of her family. Although she spent enormous sums of money on the arts, there was little permanent legacy of her work. The festivals and entertainments she arranged and the school of artists she patronized did not live on after she was gone. Only her love for architecture left a lasting mark, including several restored royal palaces, two new palaces she had built in Paris, the Tuileries and the Hôtel de la Reine, as well as the Italian Renaissance-style tomb in which she and her husband would lay. Two years after the events of the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, another dynastic crisis threatened to unseat Catherine and the Valois line. King Charles IX died at the age of 23 of tuberculosis, apparently calling out Catherine's name with his last dying breath. Leaving no heir, Charles was succeeded by his brother Henry, Duke of Anjou. Henry was recalled from the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth where he had been elected king the year before. Abandoning this throne for the crown of France, Henry came to the throne as an experienced and grown man, unlike his two older brothers. Although Catherine was grieved by Charles's death, writing to Henry that she was grief-stricken to have witnessed such a scene and the love which he showed me at the end, it was said that Henry was her favorite son. She added in her letter to him that her only consolation is to see you here soon, as your kingdom requires, and in good health. For if I were to lose you, I would have myself buried alive with you. Despite the advantages of experience, maturity, and health, Henry proved to be as equally fitful as his brothers when it came to displaying interest in the tasks of government. Henry's disinterest in ruling was perhaps rooted in his religious devotion. He showed much more interest in displays of piety, pilgrimage, and flagellation than in the politics of ruling. Just as Francis and Charles had, Henry relied heavily on Catherine when it came to the practicalities of ruling. So, even though Catherine did not have the formal powers of a regent, as she had when Charles had ruled as a minor, she continued to hold huge power and influence over the government. Henry's coronation was held at Reim Cathedral on the 13th of February 1575, and two days later, he married Louise de Lorraine Vaudemont, his choice thwarting Catherine's plans for a political marriage to a foreign princess. This marriage was a childless one, which had deep consequences for Catherine's family. Henry III's heir was his younger brother, Francis, Duke of Alençon. But instead of fulfilling his duties as Dauphin, Francis exploited the anarchy of the civil wars to his own advantage. Despite Catherine summoning him for a six-hour telling off about his subversive behavior in March 1578, Francis would not be stopped and the Valois dynasty looked set to crumble. Francis, allied with the Protestant princes against the crown and his brother, Henry III, and besieged Paris in the spring of 1576. The resulting peace of Monsieur, Francis's nickname, and Edict of Bully was granted by Catherine on the 6th of May 1576 and represented a huge concession to Huguenot demands. Protestants were now permitted to worship in public, build their own churches, and were guaranteed representation in the strongly Catholic Parliament, a guarantee which would later be rescinded by the States General of Blois and cause the return of Henry of Navarre to his Calvinist religion and to leading armed rebellion. There was also to be compensation for the families of the victims of the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. It was said that Francis forced Catherine and Henry to pass the act. Many Catholics were extremely opposed to these concessions and particularly to the recognition given to Protestant political organizations and formed their own political organization called the Catholic League in protest. As well as deepening religious grievances, 
The peace treaty also failed to bring an end to Francis's dangerous behavior. Francis's army launched a disastrous intervention in the Low Countries in the middle of 1584, but in June of that year, Francis died of consumption. Despite their differences, Catherine then wrote, I am so wretched to live long enough to see so many people die before me, although I realize that God's will must be obeyed, that he owns everything, and that he lends us only for as long as he likes the children whom he gives us. The death of her youngest son was a dynastic calamity. She had no more living sons to inherit the throne, and any surviving daughters were not eligible to rule due to their gender. The Huguenot King Henry III of Navarre now became heir presumptive to the French crown. Although Catherine had wisely married her youngest daughter Margaret to Henry of Navarre, she could rely on her daughter Margaret little more than she could rely on her troublesome son, Francis, Duke of Alençon. Margaret had returned to the French court without her husband in 1582, and Catherine was overheard berating her daughter for taking lovers. After being sent back to her husband, Margaret fled again in 1585, retreated to her property at Agen, and begged her mother for money. Catherine sent only enough money for food in an attempt to force Margaret to return home. But Margaret moved on to the fortress of Cala and took another lover, a nobleman called Dobiac. Catherine demanded that Henry of Navarre act to resolve his marital difficulties before shame was brought upon them all, and in October 1586, he locked Margaret up in the Chateau du Sceau. Dobiac was executed, though not as Catherine had wished, in front of Margaret. Catherine cut Margaret out of her will and never saw her again. Catherine's control over the crown had reduced since the reign of her elder two sons, but she still functioned as Henry's chief executive of government and as a traveling diplomat. She traveled widely across the kingdom, enforcing his authority and trying to head off war. In 1578, at the age of 59, she embarked on an 18-month journey around the south of France to meet Huguenot leaders. Her efforts won Catherine new respect from the French people, and on her return to Paris in 1579, she was greeted outside the city by the parliament and large crowds. The Venetian ambassador, Gerolamo Lippomano, wrote of Catherine, She is an indefatigable princess, born to tame and govern a people as unruly as the French. They now recognize her merits, her concern for unity, and are sorry not to have appreciated her sooner. Catherine herself, however, was under no illusions about the desperate situation facing the Valois dynasty, and on the 25th of November, 1579, she wrote to the king, you are on the eve of a general revolt. Anyone who tells you differently is a liar. As Catherine had predicted, many leading Roman Catholics were appalled by her attempts to appease the Huguenots, and in particular by the Edict of Bewley, which had furthered Protestant rights. Local Catholic leagues were formed with the aim of protecting the Catholic religion and Catholic privileges from rising Protestantism. After the death of Francis the Dauphin in 1584, the Duke of Guise assumed the leadership of the Catholic League in order to block the succession of Huguenot Henry of Navarre and put Henry's Catholic uncle, Cardinal Charles de Bourbon, on the throne instead. Guise recruited powerful Catholic princes, nobles, and bishops, formed a union with Spain under the Treaty of Joinville, and readied for war against the heretics. By 1585, King Henry III had to face the reality of war against the Catholic League, who were stirring up the civil war once more. Catherine apparently counseled Henry on the delicate nature of the situation, but also warned him that peace is carried on a stick. She wrote to her favorite son to take care, especially about your person. There is so much treachery about that I die of fear. 
Trapped in a difficult situation, Henry was unable to fight both the Catholics and the Protestants at the same time, both of whom had larger and better resourced armies than his own. Henry decided to initially seek peace with the Catholics and on the 7th of July 1585 signed the Treaty of Nemur, agreeing to meet all of the League's demands, even paying its troops. Then, driven by his religious convictions, Henry retreated into hiding to fast and pray, taking with him his personal bodyguard, a loyal force known as the Forty-Five, and leaving Catherine to find a resolution to what was quickly becoming a constitutional crisis. The Valois monarchy had lost control of the country. To make matters worse, a Europe-wide Catholic backlash against the Protestants was on the rise in 1587. The instability in France forced Henry III and Catherine to refuse assistance to England after the execution of Mary Queen of Scots on the 8th of February 1587 caused fury amongst the Catholic world and the Spanish prepared to launch its armada against England. Recognizing the vulnerability of royal power in France, the Spanish ambassador apparently told King Philip II of Spain that the abscess was about to burst. The Catholic League honored their treaty with the Spanish and seized control of much of northern France to allow the Spanish Armada access to French ports. With his rule completely undermined by the Catholic League and widespread religious divisions, Henry then made several mistakes. Seeing that Paris was vulnerable, Henry hired Swiss troops to help him defend the city and himself. But the Parisians took it upon themselves to defend the city and built barricades in the streets on the 12th of May, 1588. They refused to take orders from Henry and announced that they would take orders only from the Duke of Guise. Catherine reportedly forced her way through the barricades to mass, the people acquiescing to her passing, and then, as chronicler Lestoile reported, cried all through lunch. She later wrote to statesman and future chancellor Pompon de Bellievre, Never have I seen myself in such trouble or with so little light by which to escape. Acting upon his mother's sage advice, Henry fled Paris just in time and signed the Act of Union on the 15th of June 1588 giving in to the League's latest demands to give himself the chance to fight again another day. Then Henry made his second mistake. On the 8th of September 1588, Henry dismissed all of his ministers without warning as the French court gathered for a meeting of the estates. Atypically, he had not conferred with Catherine about this decision, and she was kept in the dark about the events while she suffered from a lung infection. Henry's mistake, and the even greater one which followed, effectively ended Catherine's days of power and the Valois dynasty. At the meeting of the estates, Henry thanked Catherine for everything she had done, calling her mother of the king and mother of the state. Then, on the 23rd of December, 1588, Henry invited the Duke of Guise to visit him at the Chateau de Blois. Again, without conferring with Catherine, Henry acted to resolve all of the problems facing him and made his third great mistake. As Guise entered the king's chamber for the proposed meeting, the 45, Henry's bodyguard, stabbed Guise to death, symbolically at the foot of the king's bed. Simultaneously, Henry's men captured eight members of the Guise family, including the Duke of Guise's brother, and the Cardinal of Guise, Louis II, who was later hacked to death in the palace dungeons. Once the murders were complete, Henry finally shared his decisions with Catherine, begged her for forgiveness, and excused his brash and violent scheme as an attempt to prevent Guise doing the same to him. Although Catherine's initial reaction to these events cannot be known, her son's actions had certainly not reflected her own cautious and shrewd diplomacy. On Christmas Day, she prayed with a friar and lamented, O oh, wretched man, what has he done? 
pray for him. I see him rushing towards his ruin. When she visited her old friend Cardinal de Bourbon on the 1st of January 1589, her promise that he would be freed soon was met with the Cardinal's derision as he responded, Your words, madame, have led us all to this butchery. Catherine died only a few days later on the 5th of January 1589 at the age of 69. It is likely that she died from pleurisy, an inflammation on the lungs, the condition which had kept her bedbound in December and which had perhaps encouraged her son to move against the Duke of Guise without conferring with her first. It was generally believed that Catherine's life had been shortened by the stress and by her anger at her son's rash actions. As Paris was still held by enemies of the crown, Catherine could not be buried there with her husband. Instead, she was initially buried at the Saint-Sauveur de Blois Church in Blois, near the Chateau Royal de Blois, where she had died. Her body was later moved to the Basilica Cathedral of Saint-Denis in northern Paris, the traditional resting place for French monarchs of the period, and placed next to her husband, Henry II. This reinterment was arranged by Henry II's illegitimate daughter with Philippa Ducci, Diane de France, Duchess of Angoulême. The tomb of Henry and Catherine, an elaborate temple-like structure with four statues representing the cardinal virtues of prudence, justice, fortitude and temperance, was desecrated during the French Revolution in October 1793 like those of many other kings and queens of France. However, the tomb was saved by archaeologist Alexandre Lenoir and preserved at the Museum of French Monuments. During the Second Bourbon Restoration between 1815 and 1830, the tomb was returned to the Basilica of Saint-Denis. Catherine was not outlived by her son for very long as Henry III was stabbed to death by Jacques Clément eight months after Catherine's initial burial. When he was killed, Henry had been besieging Paris with Henry of Navarre, who went on to succeed him as King Henry IV of France. The death of Catherine's last son represented the end of almost three centuries of Valois rule and brought the House of Bourbon to power. Catherine had outlived all of her children except Henry, who died only months later, and Margaret, who she had disowned. King Henry IV later said of Catherine, his mother-in-law and enemy, what could a woman do left by the death of her husband with five little children on her arms and two families of France who were thinking of grasping the crown, our own and the Guises? Was she not compelled to play strange parts to deceive first one and then the other in order to guard, as she did, her sons who successively reigned through the wise conduct of that shrewd woman? I am surprised that she never did worse. Catherine had risen to become the most powerful woman in 16th century Europe, born into the prominent Medici family, then, the rulers of Florence and famous patrons of the arts, she rose to become the Queen of France by marriage to King Henry II and wielded immense power as the Queen Mother of three French kings, Francis II, Charles IX and Henry III, the last French king of the Valois dynasty. But her legacy has been mired by attitudes towards powerful women and foreigners and by the controversies which coincided with her time as the power behind the French crown. The complexity of the civil and religious wars which her three sons ruled through make assessing her difficult. Catherine's influence over her sons, their governments and their policy making made her an easy target for blame. The blame she carried, whether justly or not, for the persecutions carried out under her son's rule and especially the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre of 1572, when thousands of Huguenots were killed, tainted her memory. Catherine has been remembered as the Black Queen, as a follower of Machiavelli's cutthroat political theories, rather than as a Queen Mother who pursued policies of conciliation, patronized the arts, and, above all, 
worked to save the Valois dynasty. Although Catherine's ruthlessness is not a fabrication of historians, as it comes through clearly in her letters and in the words of those who knew her, there is much more to her story. Like many female rulers before and after her, she has been flattened out by history, made into a two-dimensional character as her moniker, the Black Queen, shows, while the complexities of her character and the situation are ignored. Her authority was hugely limited by the effects of the civil wars, and in the context of the political and religious turmoil, her policies appear to simply be desperate measures to keep the Valois monarchy on the throne, from her policy of conciliation with the Huguenots and marriage of her own daughter to the Huguenot leader, Henry of Navarre, to her patronage of the arts in an attempt to glorify the monarchy. Without Catherine, it seems unlikely that her sons would have held on to the throne in their lifetimes. What do you think of Catherine de' Medici? Was she the Black Queen that history has remembered her as? Or was she the devoted mother and politically astute woman which she hoped to be remembered as? Please let us know in the comment section. And in the meantime, thank you very much for watching. Thank you.